over a period of 12 months, the City Mission worked with 100 families. They saw them every two weeks, and we went through a lot of um, conversations with families to find out what stops people moving out of poverty. Now, there's a lot of work that's done about describing poverty, talking about what poverty looks like. There's not a lot of work about what stops move people moving out. And we hear a lot of the myths. We hear the myths of people should just get a job. We hear the myths that they're lazy. We hear the myths that they don't try. And so what we thought, and I think one of the things we don't do, and we don't do in our policy a lot, and I think it's, it's starting to change a little bit, we don't talk to the people who are affected. We talk about them. And we do have echo chambers because we all think the same things. And so for us it was to actually talk to 100 families who actually are having a real experience of poverty. Why did we want to do this? Well, basically this. We just saw the increasing number of food parcels, the increasing number of people coming back and back and back to see us. And the conversations with us were about people just going around services all the time. So we did something really unusual, and so just to flip that very quickly, is we did not get um, researchers from university to do our <coughs> research, or to design it, or to tell us what we wanted to do. We were slightly over academics who come in and <coughs> almost define what research they're going to do. <laughs> Sorry. And so I sort of dreamed this up as I dream up a lot of things. And I dreamed up 100 families because that's statistically really e easy to do. So I'm not very good at the stats, but a whole year of talking to them on different topics. And then I brought in the researchers and they all went, you can't do that. It's too big. Why don't we see six families for six sessions? And then we can publish really quickly. So this was a long-term piece of work. So we did bring in researchers, and you'll actually see that our participants, our 100 families, 40% Māori, 25% Pacific Island, 22% European, and 80% women. These are stats that go all over New Zealand. These aren't just Auckland stats. This is an Auckland story, but it's a New Zealand story. So we did some very different things. We didn't just collect data, and we didn't just collect stories. We collected information in different ways. And so I'm just going to flick through very quickly. The first thing we did with our families, and I think it's quite interesting when we talk about providing social services to people, we keep talking about providing social services to individuals. So if we give a child an education, everything will be fine. If we give somebody a job, we'll fix it. We actually forget that people live in families. And actually what we don't know, and the data doesn't tell us, is what makes a family, and who are children <laughs> living with you. The reason I brought this up is because I want to talk to you about my family. Okay, I am an only child. Cool. And this is why we do <laughs> genograms, so you can find this out. Squares for men, circles for women, and I'm an only child. That gives you all sorts of connotations about what I'm saying. I'm also the youngest of five. So you got that? That's easy, isn't it? So my father was previously married and his wife died when she was 29 and they had three children and this child died when he was three days old. Okay, so I have a half-brother and a half-sister and my father's wife died when she was 29. My mother, on the other hand, was seriously into relationships. <laughs> <laughs> and she had a couple of children through here. So hence, I have two half-brothers and two half-sisters, and I am the youngest of five. That's easy, isn't it? Yeah? Simple family. My mother and my father were brother and sister-in-law. So this person and this person were brother and sister. Okay? So in my family, my brothers and sisters, fathers were our uncles, cousins, and when we used to say something in our family, is like, you're going to go and see your uncle, I'd stand in the middle and I'd say, 
is it my uncle? And they go, no. <laughs> okay, so this is my family. So I'm very traditional. I have only had one husband, and I still have him. <laughs> and I have three sons and numerous grandchildren. But from here, there were relationships where there were children who have actually been, I have inherited. And from here, where there were lots of relationships, I have inherited children. So my children range from 49 down to 32. Some of them are my sister's children, some of them are my niece's children. This is my family. Okay. And when we are working with families with Family 100, that's very, very <coughs> simple. It's simple. Not only is it simple on one level, but it's simple on the fact we just actually lived in one house, full time. The families that we see live in different houses at different times. Children move between houses all the time, they move between schools, they move because parents are in jail, they move because family breakdowns, and they don't take money with them. So when we talk about a benefit or an income for a family, we are frequently talking about the New Zealand myth. Point five, I think it is, isn't it? Are we still 2.5 children? <laughs> or 2.75? And that's how we base our benefit system on. So when we talked to people in this family 100, the first thing we did was a family tree or a whakapapa or a genogram. We find out who they are and what happens. And we would find out intergenerationally of where there was abuse, where there was violence, where there was divorces, where there were partners. Until you understand a family, how can you understand what stops them moving out of poverty and what keeps them in poverty? So that was the first thing we did with all our families. We went through all of our key themes as we interviewed people. So one of the things we did was mapping. First thing we did was mapped what services do families go to. Okay. Here you'll see, maybe not clearly, there are 45 services that this family, and we do have a family of four, very trad in the middle, 30, 45 services. This is in two weeks, by the way. Okay? And I will, I do push back a bit, I don't need to agree with everything that's going on during the day. Um, actually, there's a lot of health, <coughs> a lot of statutory, a lot of justice services, you know? Kids who are in car accidents, kids who broke the law. Here you actually have Police Complaints Authority, Restorative Justice, ACC for a daughter's death. And a whole lot of um, not-for-profits where people have gone from one agency to the other looking for food and for assistance. And every agency they went to said, go to budgeting. <laughs> budgeting, of course, will save your life. <laughs> And so 45 agencies. Now, I do get a little concerned when somebody says we should navigate, have navigators. Yeah? A little concerned. Because actually what we talk about is a family in the middle who's actually quite stuffed and a whole lot of really stuffed agencies who aren't providing the right services and then we find we get somebody who's semi stuffed to actually take them around all these services. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of money to do that. I know it's been a lot of time. <laughs> What we need to be thinking about is how these are the silos that we're talking about. How do we make these systems work better for families? Not how do we make the family change to fit the services, because it's not working. <coughs> so how do we make that different to make families' lives easier? And I said to Minister of um, Finance one day, why don't we have an app for work and income? I've got one for my bank. It just seems to be slightly ludicrous. I think it's something about so many jobs would go in the public service if we did that. <laughs> so we mapped every family. Every family we saw, this is an average sort of relationship. <coughs> okay. The second one that we really find, and we very seldom talk about, is debt. We talk about Amelia, who was common to many of the people that we saw, who when she was 18 fell in love and she met this lovely young man who said to her one day, as soon as she hit 18, really, Amelia, my mum needs a new car, and she's got no credit rating. Would you sign the form? And Amelia did. 
and for the television and for other things and for clothes and all sorts of things. And three years later, he leaves, the car's gone, television's gone, the computers have gone, the mother-in-law is gone, everything's gone except the debt is still hers. Okay? So then she's forced into a second lot of debt just to put food on the table and buy nappies. What do we do for a solution? We go, let's get rid of those trucks that go round and sell to people. But where is Amelia going to get her food from if you get rid of the trucks? Right? Maybe you should think about how do we get rid of the debt. And the second thing people said to us all the time about Amelia is, isn't she stupid? Isn't she stupid? She's signed all these forms without having a look and seeing that she's paying 171% interest. Put your hand up if you're on Facebook. Yeah, right, right up. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now, put your hand up if you've read the terms and conditions. Look right through. Wow. One. Put your hand up if you have a cell phone. Put your hand up if you've read the terms and conditions. It's usually the same person. <laughs> <laughs> and Google? No, not Google. Not Google, right. Okay. So, when you sign up to all of those things, they take all of your data. Your cell phone company knows where you are at all times. And you are giving away all sorts of personal things. And you haven't checked out what the deal is. Why should we criticise someone here who was getting her needs met because that's the way she did it? Okay, so we're really, really critical. Now, the problem is with this, is Amelia has around every week a real deficit on her income because everything that comes in, and when we talk about the $30 that she might have had left after her benefit and outgoing, that's in debt recovery. So the majority of people we saw had $11 a week if they were lucky. <coughs> and then we tell them that they need to budget better and we tell them they need to be financially literate. And I would have to say that the majority of our families were incredibly financially literate. They just didn't have any idea of how to get out of this. And so looking at responses to how do you deal with something like this and find ways for them to be able to cope. We have a big thing about who are the deserving and the undeserving, and we use language around that all the time. You know, people on benefits are drug users, they're lazy, they're ungrateful, they're bad parents. And every Christmas when we were giving out food parcels at City Mission, I'd be inundated with phone calls, those fat Polynesians standing outside your doorway smoking should be given a diet card rather than be given food. You know, the judgments we make about people, and particularly women, it is women who are in this, and the women who make judgments about them are quite appalling. So everything that is good about the rest of us, you know, we are good because we're worthwhile, we've got jobs and we're good people. If you're a beneficiary, you're not any of those things. So how do we deal with it? We make sure that income is so low that food becomes discretionary. We fine people for not being able to afford to have a car registration or a warrant and we find them some more and we find them some more until they end up in front of the courts. We apply benefit sanctions to people who don't turn up at an interview, even if the car's broken down and the baby's been sick. But you know what's worse? We sanction women whose partners didn't turn up for an interview. And so the number of sanctions is just huge and growing. Okay, do you want to flip that forward? We charge families more for power, for credit, and for housing. Anyone know what glow bug is? Yep, good. Um, and you can get glow bag, it's like a power thing put on the outside of your house and you have a card that swipes <coughs> and you can top up your power. They charge 60% more for power. Okay? Plus they take $5 the moment you put the top up on your card, $5 in debt recovery. We charge more for debt because the only place you can actually get finance is from the finance company and we charge more for housing. Okay? We reward people who want to work with low-paid jobs, and I have to take out zero-hour contracts because I think we've now banned them, which is great. And we ensure jobs around sociable hours away from transport centres. So actually working often means that you actually get worse off than what you were doing. And we talk about those people and we vilify them in the media. 
this was a real speed date on the families living in poverty. These families are not just Auckland families. I do know that they are Manawatu and Fielding and Woodville. I'm, I'm, I come from these areas. I know the poverty that has existed through generations in these areas and still does. It might not show itself in exactly the same way, but I'm sure if you had stories with families who live in poverty, they would give you similar stories about how they feel, how difficult the system is, how hard it is to access and meet their needs, um, and how often they are so unheard, treated so badly, that, that we are excluding them from being involved in a society that um, they have every entitlement to be part of. Thank you.